Hi everyone and welcome to this uh, new episode of Microphone Tense in the Trenches. Today we have a very special guest. His name is Florian and Florian is the creator of Pyral, one of the battery included frameworks that you uh, can use for building Microphone Tense. But moreover, uh, Florian is uh, a content creator, is organizing a conference on Microphone Tense, is organizing a meetup, is a published author, uh, on uh, a fantastic book, uh, The Art of Microphone Tense, uh, is working on the second edition, as far as I know. Uh, so the question that everyone has is, do you sleep, Florian? I do. <laughs> maybe <laughs> not, not as long as I should, maybe, but I do sleep and I enjoy my sleep, usually. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, uh, I envy you because, uh, you know, you, you are doing so much. Uh, for the microphone dance community and all the content that you create is uh, uh, very high quality. So if you don't follow Florian, I will share uh, his uh, uh, socials uh, in the description of the video. Uh, but trust me, uh, you can find a ton of stuff. Oh yeah, recently I forgot about that. You started also to share weekly links about the front end on LinkedIn, if I remember well. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, once or twice per week I release a list of uh, 10 articles. Uh, so always when the list is full, I release it. And uh, so far, I think we had almost 30 issues out there. So it's almost 300 links already in the year. But trust me, all these articles are written by outstanding authors and uh, always very, very nice reads. So I can only recommend those articles there. Fantastic to hear that. Great contribution to the community. But uh, first and foremost, can you tell us a bit about uh, yourself so people can uh, understand more apart from this brief introduction that I made? <laughs> sure. So hello, everyone. As already mentioned, my name is Florian Rapper. I'm a solution architect from a smaller company called Smapjot, uh, based here in Germany. Munich is our home city. And uh, what we are doing is uh, there's IoT in the name. So uh, the origins of the company are in the uh, platform creation space for IoT platforms, uh, general, you know, larger scale web applications. Uh, and I myself, I'm specialized in distributed front-end uh, applications. So that's why I'm uh, very deeply in touch with microphones, as of course you uh, as one of the uh, thought leaders in that space. So yeah, that's what we pretty much do and that's what I do uh, in my daily work. Amazing. Okay, so uh, I know everyone that is listening to this podcast want to know more about uh, Pyral. Can you give us like an elevator pitch? And, uh, yeah. and, and for me, you know, one thing that uh, probably because I'm old, I don't know, but I always love stories. And I'm pretty sure there is a fantastic story behind Pyral, why you started to, mm -hmm. to create it back in the days and uh, um, let's say how the things are, are going over there. So I would like also to hear that part. Sure. Maybe let's start with the elevator pitch to, to understand yes. what Pyral is all about. So Pyral is uh, pretty much uh, a framework for micro frontends. So you want to create a, a large scale micro frontend based solution. Um, you, of course, know may, maybe some of the tools that are out there, like let's say module federation for orchestration or single SPA if you want to. Uh, bring together some of the technologies, but uh, all of these things, I mean, they, they are only one facet. And if you say, well, what we also need is maybe templating for teams that they can easily create microphones. We need error handling. We need maybe also microphone discovery service in the heart of it, and that should integrate nicely. And we don't want to build a lot of things from scratch. Then Pyle is one way to just solve it because it comes with batteries included. It has pretty much, uh, uh, of course, uh, is opinionated and pretty much an, uh, a model of the world, how it should be. But it is also very customizable. And so it just helps you to get from your starting point to having a full-scale solution up and running. Um, from the backstory of it, I mean, Pyro wasn't just created in a vacuum. Uh, so uh, I have been working now with micro frontends. I mean, as you do, I guess, uh, before the name even was out there, right? And then you discover now they named it. So let's, uh, let's just agree on the name and let's continue. Uh, and I think the first uh, kind of solution in that space I uh, created in, in 2016 already was a platform in the IoT space for a, a smart home application. And uh, they just fit very well because we already had kind of a modularity 
on the backend side plus uh, on the on the actual home side. So they had a, a device called a smart home controller, and this device was capable of being extended with what we call drivers, right? So um, you had maybe an in, in integration with a Philips Hue system, right? And uh, so there was a driver for that, and so it con could communicate to your Philips Hue bridge. And you could just with this one controller and this was the one application, of course, then control devices, for instance, in now uh, uh, using Philips U. But then, of course, the problem is now in your real application as an end user that you are using, um, that was monolithic <laughs> originally. And so even though we had all this modularity right in the back end and on the driver side, and even vendors could, of course, extend that and write their own drivers, Still, there was one central team, and we always needed to update the application and need to extend it. And that, of course, was a huge bottleneck. And uh, so the idea was uh, born that we should also have this extensibility um, on, the, on the client side, on the front end, right? And uh, yeah, this is how we came up. And so the first draft was born, and uh, later on, I created a similar, or I mean, by coincidence, it turned out to be very similar from the architecture. It didn't start like that, but more and more requirements popped up in a, a kind of a, a customer portal uh, that we were creating for another customer. And um, there suddenly uh, it felt like what we did previously is also the solution here. So here we had different in-house teams and they already had solutions um, and they all needed to be aggregated in a central portal, right? They also already, of course, had their own backend services and microservices, of course, was um, in fashion back then, as it is, I guess, still today. And so we thought, well, what could we do here? And uh, then, of course, it was a very similar architecture, but just a little bit, you know, refined and things improved. So, for instance, originally with the, in the smart home space, we started with a JSON uh, for each of these micro frontends to describe what's in there and how it should integrate. Um, and I always felt it was a little bit too limited because especially of, on this um, yeah, portal thing, we needed sometimes very special requirements that, I don't know, certain integration points are only active under yeah, conditions that you might be able to reflect in JSON, but I mean... <laughs> You, you just, yeah, the JSON just gets bloated, right? And, and no one will understand what the JSON is about. And it would just be much easier to, to express in code because there you anyway have all the means. And so we said, let's have this integration point um, as, a, as a JavaScript file, of course. Let's start with this. So when we integrate a micro front end, and this project essentially is the closest to Pyro that you can think of. So Pyro is more or less an open source realization of that, of course, with the main uh, uh, trouble there that we also needed to generalize it, right? So there isn't any domain specific thing in there and uh, there are all these integration points for you to customize or, you know, put your own stuff on top of it. And uh, this is of course then when the bulk of the work the Pyro went in to make this really then usable, uh, not just for single use case, but essentially for, for anyone who has a similar issue creating a portal solution or let's say a large scale web application where a lot of teams can just contribute and don't have to worry about how it scales. Amazing. Uh, I think uh, it's always great seeing projects like this that are coming uh, straight from requirements uh, and help already some companies doing that. Do you Can you mention other companies that are using Parallels, for instance, at the moment? Yeah, I mean, we have some on our page listed, uh, though, of course, the, the, the number is usually quite... Uh, Higher. So there is, of course, an unknown number where we don't know anything. Then there is a number of companies where we know they're using it, but we can't just uh, uh, display the logo. I mean, uh, usually even the development teams, they would be quite open to that. But you know how larger companies work because you are in one of the largest companies. So there's always a bureaucratic layer. And uh, uh, I mean, the older or more established the company is that... Uh, it just gets tougher to to penetrate that and to really then then have a conversation and say, hey, look, guys, we also just you're using our product for free. Uh, can we at least endorse that uh, with with your name on it? Uh, but yeah, anyway. So uh, some of the companies that are using it are, for instance, uh, uh, Zeist, a German company. Um, they're using it in. Uh, uh, on one hand, on the customer portal, but on the other hand, they also have uh, a solution in the healthcare space, which is quite interesting uh, for me because this is a regulated industry. And so quite often, of course, I mean, development is really agile there, but then it hits, let's say, the real world. 
And this is where, where you need to just go through checklists and then be compliant and all that. And so at the end of the day, they have all that freedom and development. But when it gets into the production systems, it's still, I wouldn't say uh, quite strict, but uh, yeah, I mean, like more big bang releases, right? So you can't just update individual parts of the front end as you want to, just because there's always someone who has a checklist and says, hmm. Let's go through it. And so releases usually take their months, actually. And this is uh, yeah, maybe not what we are used to in the software industry, but uh, this is how things are done in the medical industry. And uh, therefore, it's quite interesting to be there. Um, to be honest with you, not only in medical. Uh, yeah. Funny enough, uh, I, I fought the uh, change advisory board, or CAB, as we were used to call in, in many organizations. <laughs> because <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's quite common when uh, let's say there isn't uh, let's say a culture that enables developers to have uh, to, to have let's say a, a safe net as i call it uh, for deploying new things maybe to kind of release blue green deployments and therefore uh, we ex the, the companies are creating these layers that they believe we will solve all their problems <laughs> uh, but it's different in distributed systems to squeeze everything in your head uh, despite uh, uh, you know you are a developer, an architect, or a genius, it doesn't. <laughs> it's very difficult. True, true that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, one other thing to mention, since I was a couple of weeks ago at a conference in London, and uh, there is uh, also a, a, a chain. I don't think they are from UK originally, but uh, they they are also uh, at least in London uh, quite some shops of uh, Nando's. I think they are called. So they they they're making some food and. Uh, yeah, so I went there and checked it out because I know they are also using Pyrel. I don't think for the customer-facing part. I think it's just for uh, some some internal portal, right, where they make uh, reservations and all of that. But anyway, so uh, so I went there and checked it out, and I can recommend the food there. So that's a funny story. So sometimes I go to uh, one of the companies that I know using Pyrel just to check out the product. Totally. <laughs> That, yeah. That's great to hear. Uh, so uh, uh, you and I we met at uh, uh, we are developers in Berlin, uh, and uh, I, I think it was uh, uh, my first time at the we are developers, and uh, I think we spent like uh, two very busy days uh, talking with each other and trying to exchange ideas and uh, uh, understand where we are in the Microphone Dance community. And I think, if, or at least for me, uh, I hope also for you, uh, it was a fantastic, uh, let's say, conversation because then uh, it continued also after that. And in the last two years, we have a lot of uh, engagements, uh, and a lot of chats uh, and uh, ideas that were bubbling around. We were in several calls with other uh, uh, people in, in, in the community. So I, I personally really love that. And I remember vividly uh, that we discussed about the, one of my favorite topics, that is the deployment and discoverability of microphone tents, that Pyral has a very interesting solution over there. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, first of all, fully agreed. This is, uh, I think this was the first time we met that yeah. we are developers, and uh, it was just a, a great exchanging ideas, talking in general, but of course also about microphones in particular. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> fully, fully share that, that sentiment. Uh, okay, so regarding uh, publishing of micro frontends, uh, as already said, from the from the historic perspective, I mean, um, Pyro wasn't born out of thin, thin air, right? So we already had some uh, uh, really, in my opinion, critical projects that were showing what, yeah. <laughs> In at least my opinion, is necessary for a microphone or where problems might occur. And deployment is certainly one thing, because the one thing that you don't want to have is that you have now this ability to create something on the side and uh, on your own and really autonomously. But when it comes then to really shipping it, you still need to ask someone for permission or need to say, hey, uh, <laughs> now I have a new team, I have a new micro front end or I have a change even. And can I now integrate it into the application? Because what you want to do at the end of the day is just say, well, I am finished with the task that is really just bound to my domain can be also technically fully be done in my uh, micro front end. And now I'm, I'm blocked here. So you want also just to make that last mile happen too and, and bring it, of course, to 
maybe even your production system, even though there might still be someone who needs to check the box somewhere, but that's that's an artificial and that's a bureaucratic. But from a technical point of view, it just just uh, should just go through, right? And uh, this is uh, where we came up with this discovery service. So now, of course, as you know, you give a lot of talks on the topic too, and uh, there's also a nice project from AWS Labs and. Uh, uh, you guys also created a very great uh, specification for um, how a uh, meter response from a discovery service looks like. Um, so we we sort of that from the beginning and said we need something like this. We need a service that's central. Uh, I mean, it doesn't need to be a service. It can also just be a JSON, but a service gives you so much more, right? You have so many more possibilities. You can already uh, make uh, the whole uh, authentication there work that you don't need to block it somewhere or need to have some CICD magic to manipulate the JSON file. So everything is just, in my opinion, a little bit more smooth. Uh, and uh, what Pyro does for you is when you are finished, let's say locally, or your build is finishing your CICD pipeline, you can just uh, take a command, package up your microphone, and it's just packaged as a tarball, so TGZ standard. You could also do it via npm pack if you don't like to use the tooling that Pyro offers. And then just make a post request essentially to the service. Um, hopefully with the right credentials, or if you have your own implementation of the service runs maybe in a VNet, you might do it without any authentication. But anyway, usually you will provide some means of authentication, let's say a token or API key. And then the service, of course, sees the, the TGZ, uh, unpacks it, gets the metadata from a package JSON, and um, yeah, then puts it in a database puts all the assets on the CDN, wires it all up, and you can, of course, then uh, be informed immediately in your microphone and solution that there is something new uh, out there. Pyrel itself does not auto-update, uh, so new users, of course, would get it if you get on the page or if you refresh the page, but out of the box, you don't get this, this live. Um, this is just the out-of-the-box behavior. We have a plugin for this, and the reason is quite simple. Even though we could stream it live, uh, usually, I mean, if you would just do it, let's say, hiddenly or as an opt-out, you would maybe be surprised because let's say your microphone contains a larger form and uh, the user fills it out. But in your implementation of the form, you never store that, let's say, in local or session storage or something, right? If we now just swap out the microphone and including the component, the, the, the local state of the form would be lost. So the user would maybe be very angry if you just wrote... Uh, I don't know, 3,000 word essay in there and suddenly it's just blank and maybe there's a little message below. We just wrote out the latest updates. Have fun with that. And that made your day essentially as a user, right? So uh, now um, putting that out as an opt-in in form of a plugin has for us the advantage that you already think about it when you install the plugin or when you opt-in. So uh, the plugin then offers to you certain ways, let's say, how to handle that update. So you could, for instance, block it if uh, a microphone it marks the state as dirty, uh, and then inform the user, we got some update in an area. Do you really want to roll it out? And if nothing is marked dirty, right, we just roll it out. But now this behavior is fully, let's say, in the hands of the developers. They know what they will expect, and they will not be surprised when it happens the first time, and they get complaints from users. So that's why I made, made it an opt-in. But essentially, again, and the basic foundation is that we have such a service and that service can uh, manage this whole uh, state of the world, what are the currently available micro front ends and how to get, let's say, an update ship uh, on the micro, the instances that are out there informed about it. Yeah, I think uh, this is a fantastic. Uh, and um, I cannot stress enough the importance of uh, not, not only the mechanism it itself, but also for fostering the right behaviors. Because I have always, uh, in many talks, I always say, wherever you do on the technology side is never just a technology decision, uh, especially when you introduce tools. It's always affecting the behaviors of people, the culture in general, and the engineering practices. And having something like that makes developers, uh, let's say, uh, more keen to see traffic in, product, uh, in production and see how their new version of Microfrontends works. Uh, and if there is uh, an issue, potentially they can roll back very quickly or they can roll forward even better uh, because 
because just a portion of the traffic was impacted, so they can fix uh, things very quickly. Because yes, working with multi-environment uh, is doable, uh, but it doesn't provide you always all the, the data points that you need in order to say, yes, I'm, 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 I feel confident as a team or as developer to uh, deploy in production and uh, uh, create value for our users. So thank you very much for sharing all these, these insights. Before we change topic, uh, tell me a bit more about uh, uh, what is the future of Pyral? What do you have in mind? <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a, a, always both a difficult question, but also a question of love. Because on the one hand, I mean, I have something in my mind, but on the other hand, I mean, getting there is, of course, a little bit of work, let's say, right? But it, it takes time. And this is, uh, I, I'm always a person who, likes to have the things fast, right? And I can't wait for it. I'm, I'm, uh, patience is one of the virtues in life, I think. And I, I still need to, to work on mine, <laughs> essentially, right? <laughs> but um, anyway, and, and I hope you feel a little bit the same and then I'll tell you what I have in mind because maybe you also say, oh, this is this is great. I, I would love to have this today. Uh, anyway, then, then let me know on the uh, standard channels, right? And then uh, this, this always motivates me and... Uh, Muscles are working faster and uh, the code is written faster. But uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, so the, the future that I envision is that, uh, of course, Pyro stays as a framework. But uh, what we will do in the also more near future is that we extract out a part of Pyro that is today known as Pyro Base. It is uh, already quite useful today, but I wouldn't say that it's used a lot. I mean, it's of course used in every, everyone who uses Pyro uses Pyro Base. But uh, the original idea was that this pile base library could also be used, of course, as a basis for, let's say, applications that don't fully fulfill what or not fully, let's say, um, <clears throat> directly applicable to Pyrel, but then of course make it still possible to use the basic ideas of Pyrel in this, this uh, let's say, other kind of application. Just to, to iterate here a bit, uh, right now, as of today, this version that we have of Pyrel uh, is based on the idea that you write your application shell essentially using React. Um, that has certain advantages for, for us. And we thought, of course, that since React is a quite big ecosystem, people will go there. But of course, over the years, what has proven is, first of all, people in the React ecosystem, they like smaller things. They like also uh, to, to be more um, yeah, independent there of, of uh, larger frameworks, uh, things that you could potentially say, who would have guessed, right? That should be obvious from the beginning. But yeah, we made that learning over the years. And second is, so many of our uh, customers and, and uh, users, they are actually based on, on, on Angular, on Blazor, on other technologies. Um, they still use Pyro because maybe in their space there is nothing better or nothing, let's say, equivalent to Pyro at least. And uh, um, so, of course, Pyro base could potentially be, let's say, for an Angular-based application, a good way out. But then on the other hand, and that's why we want to spend time here, it would have been too complicated quite often to, uh, because I mean, it just gives you, let's say a core set. I mean, that's why it's called base, but it doesn't give you, let's say some of the things that make Pyro really great, like for instance, this component model already. So this is something you would need to implement on top of it. It wouldn't be rocket science, but it would still be more work where you can then say, well, why should I use Pyro base? Then I can immediately use module federation anyway, if you need to do that. And uh, so what we uh, will do is we will, create a new library. Uh, we will present it at the upcoming microfinance conference. This library is already in the in the work and it's called Pika. Um, and this thing is essentially then the successor of uh, Pyro Base. It will be also there for the new core library, let's say of Pyro. And what it is essentially is um, a framework or technology agnostic library that you can use yeah, in, for multiple use cases, you can use it on the server in Node.js, you can use it on the client. So uh, you can use it on the server and the client that it just, you know, has a smaller footprint on the client and takes over, resumes the work that the server did previously. And it is also, uh, I mean, not only framework independent of, let's say, React, Angular and so on, because let's say on the front end, for instance, on the client, it uses web components, but it also is uh, bridging, for instance, between things like system.js and module federation, mm -hmm. 
uh, so the thing the Pal base can do today is, uh, in my opinion, a very cool feature. So you can write a microphone and just using model federation, you just plug it into Pyro and it just will keep on working. And it even shares the dependencies that you bring with this that were not there. It shares it from the model federation into the other world and the other way around, which is quite cool. Um, and this, this even goes a little bit further. It works also to some extent with native federation. So another technology that is based on ESMs and import maps. And so I think this could be a quite cool thing because also it is, uh, it allows you to work in a strongly coupled way what most tutorials in, in, in Module Federation are doing. That is say, instead of uh, need a discovery service, I have this URL and from this URL, just give me this component here. And uh, this I think is quite nice because this way yeah, you can really tailor your solution as you want to. You can say, I have these components where I always know the URLs and they, they are there. And then maybe I have a set of microphones that will come and go. I don't know. I don't care. And for this, I use maybe the discovery service. And uh, so it allows you to have all these ways essentially covered. And so a small library. And I think this uh, will be quite cool ones. And this is essentially the future where Pyrel is, is then based on because it allows us also in Pyrel to cover more targets, have more flexibility and uh, essentially uh, get more people in, even though as of today, you wouldn't fulfill, let's say, requirements in quotes, but then suddenly it allows you to enter this space. That's very nice. I think it's a very interesting approach. Uh, um, I'm looking forward to see more when uh, you will release at the Microphone Tense Conference. And I think it's the perfect segue because uh, one thing that I want to cover with you is the Microphone Tense Conference. Uh, so uh, we are not far. So we are recording that is almost May. Uh, it's end of April right now. And uh, in June, we are going to have the second edition of the Microphone Tense Conference. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, uh, my pleasure. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> last year we had the first edition of the Microphones Conference. It was an online-only conference. Uh, we had uh, 10 invited speakers. Uh, you have been one of them, and uh, pretty much every speaker did an outstanding job. We received very, very positive feedback. Uh, overall, the uh, conference um, was far beyond our expectation. I mean, since it was our first one, we didn't know what to expect, right? I never organized a conference. So not sure uh, who will sign up uh, if, if the speakers come, but everything went uh, pretty much butter smooth. We had almost 1,500 registrations, which was uh, far beyond my expectation. I thought if we can hit, let's say, 500, we are really happy. And then uh, I think you made a post a couple of days before the conference, and that also then accelerated that. Uh, there we went, I think, in a couple of days from 1,000 to, to 1,500. And uh, so overall, we are really, really happy. And then we thought, let's do it again. This time we did it with a, an open call for papers and some invited speakers. We have a great keynote coming up from you. Uh, we have great content. Uh, some of the speakers will also be uh, in Munich then. Um, and uh, I think uh, this this can be a quite cool opportunity also for the microphone and conference to come together, exchange ideas. I mean, that was always the main idea. That's how the content was selected last time. That's how the content then was selected this time. That it's all about content diversity, that we really get the broadest range of ideas in the microphone and space together, um, because there are no rights and wrongs. They are always just ideas. Some of these ideas uh, are better for, for one or the other kind of problem. Others uh, are more suited for, for other problems, but it's, it's always just about hearing ideas, being inspired, coming together. And uh, we do that um, again on the 17th of June. Uh, two tracks this time. Some of the sessions are shared across tracks. So the keynote that you are giving, for instance, will be across the both tracks. And uh, we also listen, of course, to the feedback. So we will have more breaks this time. And uh, but all the goodies, I hope, will stay. It's always it's always the sensitive part about feedback. If you follow it too much, I mean, if you try to please everyone, you will please no one. So you need to have a little bit of a footprint and in the profile. So um, we hope that we hit the nail here. Uh, but uh, let us know, of course, maybe already beforehand if there's something you'd like to see. But otherwise, after the conference, of course, how you liked it and what we can do to improve in the future. 
Oh yeah, that, that that's great, and uh, I think uh, you know uh, the conference first of all is unmissable. So if you are watching this video, if you're listening to the podcast uh, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc., uh, you must watch it because it's an absolute uh, blast every time. There are probably the let's say the all the thought leaders behind the microfrontends ecosystem. So uh, I definitely invite you to, to join. Uh, and uh, I will share the link uh, in the description of the, of the video or the podcast, because I, I truly believe that would be uh, a fantastic uh, a fantastic addition also this year. But moreover, um, I want to, uh, once again, to congratulate with, with Florian, because uh, uh, you know it's not easy organizing a conference. I organized quite a few uh, here in London. I ran a meetup um, that was one of the largest one in, in Europe, uh, and uh, I know how much effort there is behind the scene, and it's not an easy thing. Uh, so, considering how um, everyone is is investing their time in order to make this uh, conference successful, uh, I can, I'm pretty sure that would be another amazing, uh, amazing event. So, thank you very much, Florian, for putting uh, everything together for us. Thanks a lot for the kind words. Uh, okay, so last topic. But uh, I'm extremely curious. So you are, as I said, you do a lot of things, okay? And another thing that you are passionate about, uh, and probably be, probably is uh, because of your background, uh, you are also uh, close to the Microsoft ecosystem. If I remember well, you are an MVP, right? Correct. Perfect. So uh, as MVP is a uh, most valuable professional, I think it's called? Yes, yeah. Uh, so uh, it's a program of Microsoft where they uh, basically um, uh, assign this title for prominent uh, people in the community. There are several programs, not only from Microsoft, uh, but uh, definitely being an MVP uh, is a fantastic, uh, uh, a fantastic uh, honor, uh, I would say, because uh, it's not... Uh, an easy thing to to become uh, uh, one of them and maintaining also the, the MVP because every year they check if you have contribute enough to the community and uh, you remain inside the program. Uh, and I know that when uh, when you talk about Microsoft, uh, very often you talk about microphone dance, obviously, but with Blazor. And uh, uh, I have to be honest, I don't know much about it. Uh, and maybe there are other people that are listening that are not very familiar with Blazor. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so Blazor started as a, in my opinion, very innovative um, POC or uh, tech project. Uh, back then, when it started, uh, the whole WebAssembly uh, specification was just finished and the first implementations rolled out in the browsers. And um, I think the idea of, let's say, running C Sharp in the browser is not new, let's say. We've seen that a couple of times in the past. We've seen it with Silverlight, of course, right? I mean, uh, who still remembers that? If you don't know what Silverlight is, maybe you know what Adobe Flash uh, is or was. That was essentially the Microsoft Pendant, and it was uh, in some areas even better. So, for instance, video streaming used a lot of Microsoft Silverlight. It was even better than Adobe for that use case. But, of course, like Flash, it suffered the same fate. Uh, and here, developers also have been burned uh, in, in some sense because back then, open source was not such a thing. So Silverlight was never open sourced and not after the official lifetime, which means companies had to migrate away. Now, there were other projects trying to have C-sharp in the browser. There is the native client that was in Google Chrome. I think it's still in Google Chrome, but it's not uh, advocated anywhere or, or used actively. But they also had something in that you could write uh, browser extensions and that uh, for Google Chrome using C-sharp. And there were other projects that tried to transpile C Sharp to JavaScript and so on and so forth. But now, of course, using WebAssembly, people thought, well, let's see, what do we have here? And one of the things that was available was the Mono project, the Linux. And since it was, anyway, an open source implementation of a .NET runtime, so the thing that actually then runs C Sharp code, um, someone uh, thought with the name of Stephen Sanderson, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe we can use the tool chain that's already out there back then, Emscripten, and just compile that to WebAssembly. But because then suddenly we have everything to run these, these DLLs of .NET with all their intermediate language inside. We have all that in the browser. So we could in the browser just load the DLLs and run C Sharp. So he tried around and he succeeded. And then he thought, 
Now, this is already quite nice, but it would still not be usable for the end developer because, well, I mean, you would need to know still a couple of things about the browser environment. So why don't we do something and place a front-end framework in, in, on top of it? And we call that Blazor. So Blazor is essentially, therefore, a front-end framework that pretty much took some idea from React, Angular, and so on. So it's, for instance, component-focused and uh, then allows you to uh, write... Uh, pretty much your views using Razor components. So this is a, a templating syntax that was already present beforehand. Would rem remind you maybe a bit of uh, uh, JSX, but yeah, uh, diff differences. Nevertheless, you model your components instead. You write your business logic complete, uh, completely in C Sharp. And therefore, of course, you could also reuse all the C Sharp code, the libraries that you have, um, of course, with some asterisks so that might be, if it uses, I don't know, some really specialized things, reads out things from the local disk or so, then, of course, that wouldn't work so easily. But uh, in general, the pure logic in C Sharp, it would just work. Now, this was the, the origin of the Blazor project, but they knew, of course, back then that uh, WebAssembly, I mean, it was a really new technology. So maybe to make this for the masses, um, you would also need something else. So they 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 cleverly abstracted that thing. So uh, Blazor comes with a little bit of a, let's call it orchestration JavaScript. And in its default mode, of course, it loads the WebAssembly and then it communicates between what is really running in the browser in the document object model and what's running in the WebAssembly in there. So WebAssembly tells it, oh, we need now to shift things, then the JavaScript executes it. And the nice thing about this abstraction of JavaScript is that it doesn't need to talk to WebAssembly. It can also talk to something else, and it also is already asynchronous. And now one of the things they came up from the beginning on is, well, why don't we then still let it run on the server? And we have a WebSocket connection to the server, and suddenly this logic runs on the server. So now you had the two modes of Blazor. One is where you say, I throw out WebAssembly, it just runs in the browser, all good. It's a single page application, if you like to name it like this. Uh, just not full JavaScript, but JavaScript and WebAssembly combined. But then you had also the secondary mode where you say, it's still a small JavaScript, but much smaller. And it now communicates with the server who handles that session and has for every client uh, that is connected a dedicated session and just runs the logic on the server. So this is essentially WebAssembly. And with .NET 8, the latest iteration of the .NET runtime, they also um, opened up a mode that they call hybrid, where, for instance, you start on the server, and then these things, the WebAssembly files are transported over. So the next time a user comes, you can immediately start from the WebAssembly, <clears throat> essentially reducing load on the server and making it also a little bit faster um, to be interactive. And this is, this is the whole idea here behind uh, Blazor. And uh, what Blazor lacks at the moment, when, when we added, is a way also to do microformance with it. Oh, that's, uh, that, that's super cool. In fact, one question that I have for you is, uh, so I have two questions based on mm -hmm. what you said. So the first one is, uh, uh, in, in your experience, uh, how much penetration Blazor has in, in, in the front-end community? Is it like mainly uh, in the Microsoft ecosystem that you see people embracing mm -hmm. it or is also outside? I would say it's mainly the Microsoft ecosystem, but there uh, we are actually surprised. So when we created Pile Blazor, so the um, Blazor plugin for the Pile front-end uh, framework, it was also more or less a proof of concept. And we thought, let's see what we can do. There is no other solution out there in the Blazor space. So let's find out. Let's just try to do it. And we, we had a couple of lessons learned uh, along the way. But the surprising thing is, um, that we got really a lot of uh, uh, companies contacting us. So also today, uh, we, we still have, uh, I wouldn't say 50%, but it's, it's a double-digit percentage of the, of the number of contracts that we have for the discovery service, plus, of course, for uh, people um, contacting us for, for consulting that are working on, on Blazor applications. And we really see that... Uh, I mean, if you compare how often Pyrel is used, uh, how also big ecosystems are, let's say React versus Blazor, um, it's uh, for us, I mean, in general, good business to be in, in the Blazor space because even though it's much smaller, there are companies who are then really having this issue apparently. Whereas, of course, the React ecosystem, as mentioned, people are either just doing smaller applications or are then saying, well, then we craft anything uh, that we need 
uh, ourselves anyway, and we don't uh, get in touch with any companies. But here, people are really open uh, and they, they want to do that. So for us, it's a big success, even though uh, the ecosystem is certainly much smaller and restricted to, to Microsoft uh, shops, I would say. Oh, that's that's super interesting. I mean, uh, uh, as I said, I, I, I never work with Blazor, uh, and it's very interesting uh, how you describe the technology. Definitely, I will uh, take a look at that. Uh, so, okay, so that, that's pretty cool. And also, you answered my second question, that basically how uh, someone that is working with microphone tents can leverage uh, leverage Blazor. So the answer is Pyral, of course. Uh, that, that's great to hear that. Uh, okay, so before we wrap up, we always ask to every guest, uh, okay, so give us a couple of tips uh, for a, let's say, a person that wants to approach microphone tents or uh, a person that maybe uh, has just started with microphone tents. What are your uh, pearl of wisdoms? Uh, the first one is don't go for the first solution that you see. Try out uh, certain things and try to think it through, right? So the, the, the major issues that I usually encounter when we get to yeah, be involved in, in, in microphone and projects is that uh, where, of course, people are struggling is that they already started with the implementation and not just of a POC, but really we now roll everyone out of this thing, right, without having it thought through. And uh, the thought through part, what I mean here is don't just say right now we have these three, four, whatever number of microphone lens, and that's it. And we we, we, we know we have a mono repo. Okay, this is fun. Maybe already technically and organizationally, everything you think is settled. But really think the think that through. What is happening if now this external team is coming and saying, we also want to develop? Can you just share your model report? Are you allowed to do that? If you are not allowed to do that, can they still develop? What about the deployment part? Do you, if there's a new team onboarding, do you need to change something on the on the application itself or can that just run? Because these will be things that will hit you quite hard, right, at the end when you say, oh, now we have these 20 teams that are all working parallel, but we have a central team as bottleneck suddenly. This is not what you want to see. So therefore, just make some, some thought experiments Think about it, what is happening in this and that case. Some of these cases, they may not apply to you and say, well, this case we can't handle, but it will never apply to us. Also, just write it down. Make your uh, architectural records, right? That it's it's all just written down somewhere what have been the constraints. But really think about it, and not just because something works and you can load a remote module, you have a working microphone and solution. Well, this is this is like water, right? This is the essentials. Uh, this this. You should have that anyway, but it's about all the other things and really think that through. That is my one crucial advice to everyone doing doing work. Amazing. Yeah. F thank you very much for for today, Florian. I think uh, you share uh, a lot of nice stories. You share all your passion for microphone tents and the community that I think is uh, remarkable. Um, before we wrap up, uh, I just have one uh, one thing to share with all of you. Uh, so uh, this month, uh, I uh, open up a new newsletter that is called um, uh, The Microphone Tense Newsletter, uh, where I will share with you a bunch of resources uh, on microphone tense, uh, not only these uh, interviews, but also uh, way more articles that I read, the thoughts that I have, uh, and stuff like that in a fortnightly fashion. So every two weeks, you have uh, your uh, new newsletter is coming straight into your inbox so you don't have uh, even to make an effort to open the browser you can just uh, read what i'm going to share and uh, there will be a ton of insights video and uh, many contents around my front end so if, you, if you're interested uh, you will see uh, the link in the description of the video so once again thank you for attending us thank you florian for being here it was absolutely amazing having you here uh, and uh, uh, see you in the next interview of my 50 cents. Thanks.